Welcome to the Healing Broken Families podcast. I am your host, Barbara LaPointe, and each week I host healing conversations around divorce, parental alienation, and high-conflict personalities. I am delighted and super curious today with our upcoming guest. She's a family lawyer. Her name's Monica Harms, and she's been a passionate lawyer for over 20 years in a diverse law practice. And she has a focus that really resonates with our audience. She has experience around high conflict uh, cases, around high net worth cases, experience with domestic violence and trauma. So I always love to welcome a family lawyer that is trauma informed and passionate about domestic abuse. I mean, this is fantastic. Welcome to the show, Monica. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited. To, um, it's an honor to have you. Today, we are talking about what I would call a hot button issue. It's really relevant to what's going on in the world. And we're going to start our podcast talking about co parenting and divorce uh, with respect to vaccinations. Um, this is a topic I'm really passionate about, and I hope that I can learn something about this topic because I think parents are really interested in this and then I would just invite the audience to stay tuned because at the very end Monica I'll invite you to talk about uh, a different subject and just give your very best counsel and your very best advice for parents going through divorce when it comes to social media and posting on social media so you can sure. give your your very best tips and we'll save that as as a as a fun way to end and um, maybe offer some great tips and strategies because we're all living our life on social media, it seems. And uh, yeah, so that I'll be interested to see what you say about that because I've even posted things in my divorce on social media that I wished I wouldn't have. That's right. It happens. Let's start with vaccines um, in terms of custody. I'll, I'll open up the floor and invite you to set the stage for that theme. Sure. Well, vaccines are certainly a hot button issue, and it's it's really a, a unique novel issue because it hasn't been something that's been really um, in the forefront of, of family law for very many years. I mean, certainly there are vaccines that children have to have to be enrolled in school, but because they have to be enrolled in school, it, it hasn't really been something that's been optional in the past. And so with COVID and having this new choice for parents, it's it's been a real struggle for parents who can't agree on what to do. And usually, you know, certainly in an intact family where husband and wife are still, or wife and wife or husband and husband, two, two partners are still married, um, or just two partners have a child together and they're deciding what to do, um, they still have that conflict, right? So it just comes to light when two people are divorced or separated and they're no longer operating under sort of that same, that same um, shield of decision making and they have to decide whether or not their child should be vaccinated. So generally the way we think about these, these topics um, from a legal perspective is whether or not a child is vaccinated is a legal custody issue. There's essentially two kinds of custody. There's legal custody, which is like decision-making, where does your child go to school? You know, Do they get a vaccine? Are they gonna get a passport? There's sort of those big ticket umbrella items, religious issues. And then there's, there's physical and residential custody. Those are two very unique ideas. One's decision-making, one's where does a child live? So this vaccine issue, this falls squarely in this legal custody decision-making. Um, area. And um, because it's so novel, it's not something that there's a lot of courts that have decided this issue. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, normally we look to case law and it's pretty clear we can see what, you know, a case, what, what the case law says or the courts have decided to do. For instance, you know, private school, let's say a child, one parent um, wants a child to go to private school, the other child parents says, I don't want the child to go to private school. There's a whole body of case law we can look at and we can apply all these different factors, you know, that we know the court's going to, going to apply and we can sort of be able to counsel our clients and give them a really good idea of, okay, here's probably how this is going to shake out because you've got, you know, you want private school, you have a history of private school. 
your family can afford private school. Maybe your child has a specialized need for private school. There's all these, you know, delineated factors that we know we can check through and decide, okay, this child is probably going to be able to go to private school if these parents disagree. And if we go to court and get before a judge, when we go through all of these factors, they have a really strong case to be able to, you know, get private school. So that's the analysis we go through in a normal legal custody decision where two parents disagree. Then you have vaccines or we don't have this list of, you know, well articulated items. So I guess the first place to start is when people get divorced, um, by and large, a lot of parents have joint legal custody. And the reason they have joint legal custody is because by and large, in my experience, I found judges like to give two parents equal decision-making authority with the thinking that two heads are better than one, even two heads who maybe don't get along well, maybe they get along and they love their child um, so much that they can sort of move past some of that conflict to make decisions. So by and large, in most cases, people have joint legal custody. And that's kind of where I want to set the stage because if two partners don't have joint legal custody, and one has sole legal custody, then it, our discussion really, you know, they're going to make the decision. If you have sole legal custody, you can decide whether to vaccinate your child or not. It's really the conflict comes into the joint legal custody arena. So, yeah. So let's let's go on that premise that it's joint legal custody and then there's a conflict with this. And I just want to come back up and confirm and clarify when you're shielding your child. I like the fact that you use that word shielding because this is, you know, parents are here to protect their children in my, in my view. So is this like a medical decision or a religious issue or both? Well, that's, that's a great question. Is it medical or is it religious or is it both? So that's something that, that like I said, hasn't been argued and decided by the courts. However, when it comes to vaccines, um, there are what what we know as lawyers is there are things a court is going to look at and consider. And so one of the most important factors, I believe, as a lawyer, although, like I said, a, a, a a higher court hasn't told me this, but I would anticipate that if this case came before a higher court in many states, one of the very important decisions that is going to be taken into consideration is under this umbrella of the best interest of a child. So does the child go to school where a vaccine is required? OK, that's a very easy factor favoring, you know, vaccination. Does the um does the child participate in extracurricular activities where um, they might be precluded from doing the things that they love to do because they're not vaccinated? That's going to be a factor that weighs heavily in favor of a parent who wants a child to be vaccinated. Um, another one might be the reasons why. So the, here's where religious comes into play. Like perhaps a parent has a religious belief that they don't want um, their child to be vaccinated. Um, there is a little bit of, of case law. I practice primarily in Marin, Maryland. There is a case in Maryland where the Court of Special Appeals found in a juvenile case that a child's compelling, um, I think the words they used were, uh, the state has a compelling interest to protect the health of a child, which outweighs a parent's religious belief. OK, so so in that case, that was a vaccine. I can't remember what vaccine that was, but that was a parent who didn't want to get a child vaccinated. And a court found that 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 would be the right thing to do. Um, a child's health is going to be play a factor. Per, perhaps it's a child that um, has some health issues um, and in consultation with, you know, a pediatrician, perhaps, you know, a vaccination might make a real difference in that child's health. Um, so these are all factors that are taken into consideration that really loop back to that idea of the best interest of a child. Mm -hmm. um, and and these, are, these are all factors, I think, that, you know, you think about in figuring out whether or not it weighs in favor of vaccination or, or against vaccination. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Monica. It's a complex issue. And so my, like, mostly we're talking mm -hmm. about the scope of like there's all vaccinations, but the COVID vaccine has been particularly controversial in North America. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, broadly speaking, what's happening in Canada is that there are parents that are saying, no, I, I don't want my child to have this vaccine. And there's a conflict between one parent or the other. 
and generally speaking, because I'm not a family lawyer, I'm just a mom and coach. Um, but what I've seen in the media and what what I've seen happening in Canada, I don't uh, is that judges are saying, well, uh, they're just going with whatever the government says, and they are saying they're making orders that children are to be vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine. And what I generally say, speaking for Christians, and I'm just, I'm just, I hope Christians don't mind because it's not all Christians, um, but there's a majority of Canadian Christians that are saying they want to shield their child from the COVID-19 vaccine. And there's been so many cases in Canada. Actually, there was even a case of a father who kidnapped his child, received a ton of media. His name was Michael Jackson, strange name. And uh, he took his child for like three months, but then he was found. And the mom was saying, well, I just want to do whatever the government tells us to do. And he was saying, we're Christians and we don't believe in this COVID-19 vaccine. He even doubted that it was an actual vaccine. Um, anyways, of course, he's in jail and he's lost his child and he has uh, massive legal bills. And the child's been returned to the mom and it's probably going to be vaccinated but this child was seven years old. So I invite you to speak to that kind of thing when Christians are saying, because I think they're an important part of the conversation, generally speaking. They're just saying, no, we don't agree with the COVID va vaccine and we don't think this is a vaccine. Then judges are saying, well, just do whatever the government says. And thirdly, the girl who was kidnapped, and there's been a couple of cases like this, high profile cases, she was like seven years old. So when like, when might a child be able to express a voice and choice saying this is my body? Um, Cause it, and I don't want a vaccine. If that, like just to postulate that as well. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like it, it's a hot button issue. I mean, and it's it's a hot button issue that's changing every day and it's, it's you know, change, if you think about where we were in, you know, March of 2020 to where we are now, it's it's still very different. It's a very different landscape. The idea of boosters is now an issue. Places where you had to be vaccinated, some places are rolling back those um, those mandates. And so it, it is, it's a landscape that's continuing to change. But as to your issue um, about an age when someone wants to have a say, certainly, um, most places, I won't say all, but many, many places don't have a specific age. And the reason there's no specific age is because children mature at different times. You know, you may you may have a very mature, um, articulate 11 year old child who is able to really express their desires. You may have a 13 or 14 year old who, you know, isn't able to do that. And so um, by and large, a lot of a child's preference um, is depends on their their age and their maturity and their reasoning behind whether or not you know they, they want a vaccine and why. Typically, parents are always going to be the default. So, so children are not going to their voice is not going to be given the same kind of weight as a parent's, particularly when it comes to medical issues, because a child is just doesn't have the life experience to be able to really opine on their on their medical um, health the way that I think certain courts would ex would expect those decisions to be made. However, where I think a child's voice really does come into play is school, extracurricular activities, their social life. If a child is is loving their community and, and their school and their um, soccer team, and their soccer team has a mandate that they have to, everyone has to be vaccinated, or they can't participate, that's the kind of voice where a child says, this is a really important part of my emotional and social well-being, and I really want to continue to be um, a part of this. And so that's where I think a child's preference is, is really going to come into play, is when being vaccinated or not precludes or doesn't preclude them from living, you know, their life and being able to have the benefits of all the social and emotional, you know, activities and resources that they would normally have. Um, you know, we haven't had uh, any, any, I, I haven't heard of that kidnapping case, but it's, but it's very interesting. And I've thought through though, you know, what happens when you have two parents who disagree about a vaccine one says yes, one says no. They're sort of in the middle of working through that conflict. What if the person who wants the child vaccinated goes out and gets the child vaccinated? You can show up most places with your child and get them vaccinated. Um, 
without having two parental signatures. And so I've thought, what would the fallout of that be? Right. Because, you don't, you know, I certainly wouldn't advise a client to do that. But I've thought, you know, as a legal professional, what do you do if a client comes to you and says that's the case or a client says, here's what I want to do. I want to just go ahead and get them vaccinated. Because at that point, the milk is spilled. They have the vaccine in them where there's no way to undo that. Um, And I think it's an interesting question. And and in my mind, the way that that plays out is, you know, having joint legal custody of a child is is a privilege as a as a parent. And so doing something that contravenes that joint legal custody um, against that joint legal custody privilege is something that could really come back to bite that person's ability in the future to make those kinds of decisions. So in the the way that I would see that playing out, if I had a client come to me and say, you know, we were in the middle of discussions about whether or not to have our child vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And my partner, co-parent went out and had our child vaccinated without my consent. I would say, well, then I think here's what you can do about it. They're already vaccinated. So there's nothing you can do about that. However, we can go to court and we can try to change that joint legal custody decision-making framework so that in the future, they don't have the ability to do that because they've proven, they haven't proven, but they've, they've, they've um, acted in a way that would be convincing to a court that this parent is not really capable of joint parenting and making joint decisions. When you go out and you decide that you're going to do something that you know can't be undone, that, that battle may be over but we can at least pave the way for something like that not happening again. And so that's really the advice that I would give a client who came to me who said, I want it. I want to vaccinate my child, you know, just without the other parent's consent, even though I know that I'm not supposed to, or a parent who said, guess what? My co-parent went out and vaccinated my child without my consent. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't really fix the immediate problem, but it, it does, I think, I think you have to take a strong approach there because that to me indicates that there may be problems down the road and this is just the first of many. Yeah, that's such a terrifying thought as a parent that one parent would make a, a decision like that without permission. That is a terrifying thought. And I think for a lot of parents, this is a heartbreaking issue, a heartbreaking issue. Now you were speaking about extracurricular activities like soccer or just going to university. What about travel, Monica? Like um, you can travel in Canada. Um, And I know it's just always changing too. That's the thing. All the time, all the time. That's what I'm saying. You know, it can be an issue today and in a month it may not be an issue at all. Right. And that's really frustrating to think that you would make a decision today. Maybe a decision is made that you don't agree with, but then it could change in a month. You know, Um, I actually just went uh, on a trip recently um, and I love to travel. But like, what about travel for kids with respect to the issue of um, vaccinations? Because you can travel without them. It's not fun. It's not easy. But it's factual that folks can travel without them now. Well, so it depends on what kind of travel. Um, certainly, there is a lot of international travel that when when parents get divorced, off, well, to get a passport, number one, you have to have both parents' signatures. So if you have joint legal custody, you have to jointly agree to get a passport. Um, and then with that passport, um, there's not just unfettered access to travel wherever you want to go. And so I, I recently had a case where um, a child was unvaccinated and needed to travel. And as part of travel, they didn't have to be vaccinated, but, but one parent really wanted them to be vaccinated before they would travel. And so that was, that was one, that was an, to allow the travel, they said, okay, you will allow the travel, we'll agree to the travel, but there has to be, has to be coupled with this condition of vaccination. So in my experience, it's become kind of a negotiating chip in some circumstances. Now, in that case, I think that parent really wanted their child vaccinated. And I think they saw this as an opportunity to use that as a way to, okay, you can travel, but if you really, you know, if you really want to travel, then I want our child to be vaccinated and they ended up agreeing that that would be the way that it worked out. Um, but you know, that it's a, again, it's, it's constantly moving. It's constantly changing what you can and can't do um, in the world with or without a vaccination. That's so fascinating. Actually, I, I wouldn't want to be a family lawyer right now, but it's also really hard to be a parent right now. Yes. I, 
I would suggest. So I'll ask you this next question. If it if it doesn't land right or if it's you can't address it, then just let me know because I'm not a lawyer. But I was imagining a, a scenario whereby you had a because there's vaccines and then there's the COVID vaccine. That's just my view. Right. But if you had a child and let us postulate that they didn't have any vaccinations, maybe they were in the U.S. or Canada, maybe they, they just didn't. It could be religious or otherwise. But then one parent says, I want them to have the COVID-19 vaccine. But for the child's life, they hadn't had all those other routine vaccinations. And that, that I mean, that seems like that could happen in the world. Because mm -hmm. COVID-19 has been such a scary, scary thing for so many people. Like, um, And the COVID-19 vaccine has been such a a strong narrative i would suggest so then okay she doesn't have he or she doesn't have any of the other vaccines and there's there's quite a few families we don't like to talk about them that exist that don't have them um and it's controversial to talk about but this is a controversial subject so in a case like that but the, would they consider the precedent of the of the family's choices previously and then continuing on saying no i don't I want to, you know, I don't want the COVID vaccine kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's an interesting question because so these questions really only come to light when there's a conflict, right? Because if two parents agree, then then we don't we don't necessarily hear about it. We hear about it when someone disagrees with with the 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 path that they're on. So if you have a family who hasn't vaccinated a child at all and now the COVID vaccine comes along and one parent wants the vaccine and the other parent doesn't want the vaccine well then you know we're sort of back in that idea of why why do you want the vaccine now and why haven't you vaccinated a child before and it's an interesting question because it actually is much more compelling to not have the child vaccinated if during um, the intact relationship as parents, because that's what, you know, judges yeah. often look at when the parents are in an intact, you know, an intact family where they're really, they're really uh, negotiating decisions, you know, very um, in concert. What did they do then? Um, we look at those, we look at those decisions, um, you know, like I said, I go back to, to private school, to religion. Oftentimes we look back and say, okay, what did they do when they were together and they were making these decisions as, as, a, as a family together? What were they deciding? And now that they are no longer together and these decisions have changed, what's really changed? And so that's where the precedent really does matter. Um, now that doesn't mean that, that a a court wouldn't say, okay, I hear all that, but, you know, there are some compelling health reasons why, you know, this may happen. But to, to answer your question, it, it really does make a difference what they've done in the past and how they've um, co-parented together in the past, So just those decisions. Yeah, that's a fascinating answer that you just provided because to, to know that we look at the past, because sometimes when you get divorced, everything does change and sometimes parents will make these drastic, you know, um, choice changes or have different behavior that they've ever, ever had in the past, which is a weird thing about high conflict divorces. Right. Right. I mean, a lot of, there's a, there are a, a lot of legal custody things we look back on um, that are, you know, like the vaccine, you know, like I said, religion, you know, we look back to see what, what the parents did previously. We look back to see, you know, something like cell phones, you know, when do you get a child a cell phone? Well, when they were together and they're, you know, their oldest got a cell phone at this age. And so why are we doing it different now that they're separated? And so how parents sort of deviate from those, decisions that they made together as as an as an intact unit um, that really matters and they have to if, if they're going to make a different kind of decision now they're going to have to really explain why that is yeah it's a really really good point that you just raised so backing up a bit with uh, respect to religious exemptions do you find um do you find they're being considered as valid uh valid documents. Um, I know there's airports um, that aren't considering them as valid documents. Um, you know, there's, and, and that's a shame. So because some families that don't want a vaccine might actually have a, a valid religious exemption from a pastor. Are courts looking at those? 
So I haven't had um, any cases in that I've dealt with in Maryland. There isn't, there isn't any precedent that talks about the religious exemption besides this 2019 case that came down. And that was one, it wasn't about the COVID vaccine, but that was a case where the court found a compelling interest that the, that the child should be vaccinated, that it, that it outweighed um, the religious belief. Now, because things are changing all of the time and the court system moves very slowly. So, you know, you have a hot button issue today and by the time you get in front of a court, which could be, you know, a year from now, the issue is moot or there's a new issue that's come about or the vaccines really, you know, to do whatever a parent wanted to do or their, their reasoning behind a vaccine might've changed. And so we're seeing a lot of that, that um, sometimes it's just a matter of kind of waiting to see how, the world plays out a little differently. Um, there are circumstances when you need to get a vaccine immediately that you can try to go into court on an emergency basis, but courts generally don't deal with these kinds of things as emergencies unless it's it's truly something that, um, you know, is kind of a truly emergent where the child's health and well-being is going to suffer if, if the decision isn't made immediately. Mm -hmm. So you'd mentioned so many times that it's a changing landscape. So this might be a tough question. It might be volatile. Again, just let me know, because these are just questions that come okay. into my curious mind as a coach. So there is a, a registry, a formal database called VAERS, and that's V-A-E-R-S. And it's actually a registration of vaccine side effects, including death. And there are many children but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm using broad scope terms um, that have had adverse side effects to this COVID vaccine. I'm speaking about the COVID vaccine and died, even died. So is it is it uh, um, emotionally cruel to like, look, could we postulate that? What if one parent want the vaccine? And in Canada, if that goes before a judge, it's about it's pretty common right now that judges are just saying, do what the government says, do it. You need it. Um, and that the parent who doesn't want the vaccine, would, are, they're losing. They're not getting, in, generally speaking, that's what the trend we're seeing. So what if the child had an adverse vaccine effect or died? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the so when you say that, that judges are saying do what the government does, that's, that's a classic example of you know, it's a, it's a difficult decision. And so the easiest decision is to let someone else make the decision. Right. And so if judges are saying, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get into that mess. If the government is saying that it has to be done, then we're going to go ahead and do what the government is saying that we're going to do. And as, as a parent from a legal perspective, that's a very difficult hurdle to have to deal with. Um, that's where, I mean, hiring a lawyer that can be a really good advocate for you to be able to explain in a very compelling way why, you know, your child and your family may not fit into this box where a government has made sort of a broad brush stroke that a vaccine is appropriate. Really, you, you have to be able, if, if the government is saying this vaccine is appropriate, then really what you're trying to prove is that, is that your child is an exception. And so why is your child an exception? Why is your family an exception? You know, what are all of those factors? And that's where having a lawyer be able to articulate specifically what's unique about your family, your child, what you know about your child's health, what you know about your child's social and emotional well-being. All of those are going to be ways that you can best protect yourself and your child if getting a vaccine is not something that, um, that you want your child to have. Yeah, this is so valuable and so fascinating. Like really just, it's such, it's, I think we're serving parents right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. Good. But we know that high conflict parents often don't, well, almost often or almost never communicate very well. Do you have some advice for parents facing this emotional issue? Oh gosh. So lots of things. So I think sort of understanding that going through the divorce is, the, the worst of it, right? So we always hope things are going to get better. So that's number one is sort of understanding that it's the worst part and sort of holding on to that hope that it's going to get better. Because I think that does, that does help people to sort of put that into their, in, into their perspective. However, 
there's some relationships that don't get better. There's some relationships that actually get worse after divorce. And so the key to co-parenting is communication. So it's finding these alternative means of communicating. And there's a lot of different resources to be able to do that. Um, so number one would be like perhaps speaking in person or over the phone is, is just maybe it escalates into conflict very quickly. And so maybe deciding that you, you know, should only communicate by email would be the best protocol. I can't tell you how many times I work on parenting plans with people and we put in place specific communication protocols. So if you have an, if you want to talk about enrolling in soccer, then the subject line should be enrolling in soccer write what your request is, write what you are looking for from the other parent. And we put in there that you have 24 hours to respond with a yes, with a no. And if it's a no, then you need an alternative of or an explanation of why. And so when people get divorced, putting in place those frameworks so that everyone sort of understands the rules and the expectations, those can be really helpful. There's also a lot of online um apps and programs where you can, you know, put information, you know, calendars where you can both populate it with information that you might need to share with the other parent that that limits sort of the back and forth conversations that might happen. Um, you know, I use the example of email as a good way to communicate. There are some parents that the tone of emails are what set them off. And so what they really need to do is, is talk on the phone. You know, if it's a really important decision that needs some back and forth dialogue, they decide that they should do it by phone. So I think some of the best advice I give parents is let's realistically think about your communication with your with your partner and your your co-parent. And how do you how do what are the trigger buttons? How do we avoid the trigger buttons? Is the trigger buttons a tone? Is a trigger button that when they send emails, they're 10 pages and you feel like that's you know burdensome? Um, what is it that really gets to each of you? And how do we figure out how to carve those things out so you can stay really focused on the child? Um, and really the, the last way um, that is really helpful is a parent coordinator. Um, a parent coordinator who can sit down with the two parents and talk through the issues that if they're talking alone might derail very quickly. Now, the problem with a parenting coordinator is you can't, you know, assuming you have a small child who's one, you got 18 years ahead of you. And so for 18 years, it's, it's burdensome to involve a third party and expensive to pay a third party to help resolve all of your issues. But sometimes at the beginning of a you know, divorce or the beginning of a separation where two parents are no longer living together, that's, you know, that's an important time where maybe employing a professional to help work on those communication would be, would be, um, would be worth both the time and the expense. Yeah, those are really good tips and suggestions. And, um, you know, I see the value of having a, a parent coordinator because it's a neutral third party. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in a high conflict case um, where you had a, one high conflict personality that was skilled at manipulation, um, do you think a high con like, do you think a parent coordinator could coordinate a high conflict case? And what is their level of education in the States? I know in Canada, it's pretty low and I don't know if it matters, but I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And I can't tell you how many clients have asked me that question. So what I will tell you is there's a small, you know, where I practice, there's a small group of parent coordinators. There aren't enough of them. Um, they're very busy, but the ones that I typically send my clients to, they are very good. OK, so when they say like this person is, you know, manipulative, they can see through all of that very, very easily, very quickly. Um, sometimes, you know, preparing your client to be the parent coordinator and saying, OK, if you're if you're worried about manipulation, print out some emails that you think evidence this kind of behavior that you find manipulating and give that to them. Because you, if you tell a parent coordinator, you know, my my ex partner is manipulative. OK, that's that's really giving them a label, but uh, describing to them or showing them the conduct, that's really what helps inform 
a professional about how to deal with someone. And so number one, it's preparing, preparing to work with the parent coordinator. Okay. And then the second piece of it is parent coordinators. Um, oftentimes some, some are lawyers, some are licensed clinical social workers, some are psychologists. Um, but the ones who have done parent coordination for some time, a lot of them are very good and they can see through the manipulation. They can see through, um, sort of the show that one side may put on. And so I think you have to go into the process. Um, you have to interview the parent coordinator, you have to get recommendations, and then you have to go in, you know, you have to assume that they're going to do their job and do a good job. Because if you go in assuming they're going to be manipulated, um, that's just not the right headspace to be able to make progress in. That's, that's really reassuring. Uh, yeah, because we're so emotional. It can be so emotional when you get sure. divorced and you can get jaded. So I like that you said that. Um, at the beginning of this podcast, I said that at the very end, we would just have some fun and talk about social media. But at the same time, social media, correct me if I'm wrong, can be pretty detrimental and a serious subject in custody disputes and high conflict divorces. So let's back up. You were talking about those triggers, which I thought was amazing because we do get really triggered in divorce. So to have your family lawyers support you in that way and point that out is great. And then you mentioned being triggered by the tone of an email from your ex. And I would imagine that it happens a lot to parents out there in North America. So let's set the stage. You get an email, your the tone has triggered you, and then you take off to social media. What do you recommend? Okay, so my golden rule that I tell my clients, and this is a golden rule with a text, with an email, with a Facebook post, with an Insta any social media post, anything you put in writing, assume that a judge will read it. Because when you look at it from that perspective, if you assume a judge will read it, it'll make you stop and think, okay, how is how is this going to make me look? What sort of inferences can be drawn from this? Um, and I, I can't tell you how many times social media posts can really sink someone in their divorce, okay? Whether it's even someone who's accused of committing adultery and they've you know, they post a picture of themselves, you know, in, in some city at a concert and then someone else is tagged, maybe not even associated with that same account. But, you know, you can you can connect the dots pretty easily. Um, there have been posts where people comment on, you know, sort of their spouse, comment on their children, uh, comment on um, just things that maybe you you wouldn't be proud of if you take a step back and really think about but mm -hmm. social media posts can can really hurt um particularly custody they can show that that a parent is not able to sort of rise above the conflict and work towards the best interests of a child which is sort of the linchpin of every custody decision is is this parent able to put the child in the center to, to um, make decisions which are child focused. And as soon as you can show evidence that a parent's focus is, you know, pulled towards getting back at the other parent, revenge on the other parent, you know, social media posts, kids have social media accounts too. So even if your child isn't on social media, your child's friends are on social media, your child's friends' parents are on social media. So people will see that and it will get back to a child, even if that path isn't as direct as a child seeing it firsthand. And so um, people, I mean, generally, look, in life, we have to be very careful about what you post on social media, but certainly someone going through a divorce, going through a separation, who is um, making sure that some decision maker down the road, you know, some some judge or decision maker who's who may be deciding on, you know, the legal or physical custody of your child. Like, I can't imagine anything that's that's of, of more significance in your life than where your child is going to live or what decisions are going to be made about their life. I mean, posting something and having that impact your future ability to, to parent them the way that you want to, that is never worth sort of the emotional, um, the emotional response of, of a post. If I had a highlighter, I would just, and we were right, I would highlight everything you just said for the last five minutes. 
because uh, sometimes we're just, yeah, we're not clear on how serious the consequences of negative social media posting can be. And isn't it true with in family court cases that it, it's, a, it's a long timeline too? Like you can pull a post from social media at any point, five years ago, two years ago, or six months ago, right? That's right. And, you you know, people think they delete things. Nothing's ever really deleted, you know, with, you know, you can screenshot just about anything these days and have it. And once you have it, you have it. Um, so it's it's something that really has to be maintained with the utmost level of care for for the benefit of your children. It's tough because social media is kind of a way that we socialize and feel connected to our community. So if like, would you ever say just take a break from social media while you're going through your case or? Um... Well, yes, I've, I've, I have said that before. I have said take a break from social media, but I think more regularly, look, po posting things that are maybe um, angry that might come back to bite you. Really, that's that's indicative of someone who's who's going through some pain and some trauma and looking for an outlet to um, usually when you post something, you get, you know, you get all these comments, comments of support or comments, you know, you're mm -hmm. looking for that sort of support. And so um, my advice would be to employ, you know, a really good mental health professional and 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 have talk through those issues with someone who's really equipped to hear them. And um, social media is not the place to be, you know, posting those kinds of things and getting getting the support you're looking for. Look to your family, your friends, a mental health professional, um, people in your life who really care and love about you that are, that are a safe place that you can vent all of those feelings, which are so valid. You know, you're going through a divorce. Of course, everyone has these kinds of angry, upset, hurt, all of those feelings are, are really valid and need support um, from people, but social media is not, not the place to get them. Yeah, really important, really important points. And great that, you know, you encourage people to hire a mental health professional or a divorce coach. Mm -hmm. um, are, lawyers in, are, are lawyers supposed to do that? Like if they have a client going through family law or going through divorce and they're emotionally distressed, are they sort of inclined to recommend the outside support that's emotional? Yeah, I mean, just about every client that I see, we talk about what support they have in place. And some people have really good support, others do not have. We talk about what the different resources are and, and what resources they might best utilize so that they can they can keep themselves in the best place. And also, you know, I, I say it, I feel obligated to make sure people have a support system in place because I found that sometimes my clients will use me as their support system, right? They'll, there's, I have a very, you know, I, I, I want to be, you know, an open ear and I want them to be able to lean on me and tell me things, but I'm their lawyer. I'm, I'm engaged with getting their case into the right legal framework and getting them what they are entitled to and their children under the law. But as far as, you know, working through the hurt and pain, that's, that's not what my degree is in and someone else, you know, should, that's, that's an expensive role for me to play for them. And so that's where I really encourage them to, to use those resources that they have outside of their lawyer. Yeah, that's another really good point that you just made. You've made a lot of good points. I, I feel really happy with our conversation that it's serving people with solutions and help, help during a really difficult time. Oftentimes we talk about solutions and healing on this program. So I'll just open it up to you in our last minute together to um, impart some wisdom. You've already shared a lot or, or share anything that you'd like to share with anyone that might be listening right now. Well, I mean, I think your, you know, your bod your podcast is really important. Healing, healing families is, is a really important topic and it, it looks different for every family. It looks different for every individual. Um, and, and I think, I think the part that is most important to think about, at least from a legal perspective, is this, this too will pass. Everyone who has been divorced, um, whether it's a year ago, two years ago, a decade ago, they often look back and realize that that was a really bad time. It's not something they'd want to relive, but that time has passed and they're in a new chapter. And so much of um, after someone is divorced is sort of 
redefining themselves in a, in a way that can be kind of exciting. And, and the new chapter can be exciting if people allow that to be exciting for them. And so I, I constantly encourage my clients like, you know, think about what's next. Think about what, you know, what does the next five to 10 years look like for you? Because that helps them really see forward because it's so easy when you're struggling with the hurt of a divorce to stay caught in that moment and not really think past it. And and kids need that too. You know, if you're parenting kids, they're feeling the energy that you're stuck in. And so thinking through how to pull them out of that as well um, and, and really look forward to me is, is a really important part of the legal process, constantly reminding them that this will pass and we'll be in, you'll be in a new chapter. And what does that chapter look like? Because let's, let's make a plan for you for that new chapter. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, that's very inspiring. And I want to honor you and thank you for the ethical and good loving work that you're doing in family law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before you go, if anyone wanted to reach out to you and your contact information will be in the show notes, how could they reach out to you if they um, if they needed to? In um, they can email me or call me. Um, I'm I'm always available. Email is probably the best um, the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, my email is mharms h a r m s at steinsperling.com. Um, and my phone number is 301-838-3230. Okay. And we'll have that in the show notes as well. So thank you for tuning in to the Healing Broken Families podcast. If you like this episode and you like the content that we're creating, please like, subscribe, share, make a comment in the comment section, but wishing you healing solutions in the now. I'm Barbara LaPointe and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Barbara. Have a good one. You too.